The war in Afghanistan is often described as the longest war in U.S. history, but most of the American servicemen and women who fought the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Central Asia weren't even born at the outset of another American war that still rages on. President Richard Nixon declared the so-called War on Drugs back in June 1971, and nearly 46 years later, our nation has yet to claim victory or admit defeat. Even though the casualty count from that conflict continues to rise, our strategy and our tactics are changing rather dramatically. Military interdiction, mass incarceration, and the take no prisoner ultimatum just say no are giving way to research, treatment, and economic support, all of which could be summed up as compassion. Hi, I'm John Schwannis, and on this edition of Indiana Lawmakers, we'll take a look at our state's ongoing battle against substance abuse and addiction. Let's start with this legislative update from WFYI Public Media's Jake Harper. The addiction epidemic in the United States has been growing for some time. In 15 years, the rate of deaths from all opioids, including prescription drugs, has more than tripled. Indiana has the 17th highest overdose rate in the country, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In 2015, there were more than 1,200 deaths. In that same year, disaster struck in Scott County. People using injection drugs while sharing dirty needles led to an outbreak of HIV that has since grown to nearly 200 cases. The crisis in the county has brought the issue of opioid addiction into sharp focus for lawmakers in Indiana. Governor Eric Holcomb announced that tackling the epidemic is one of his five priorities in the State of the State address last month. This epidemic causes ripple effects with devastating impacts on our children and families, our cities and towns, our schools and government agencies, our healthcare system, and our healthcare costs for each of us and our economy. A study from the Fairbanks School of Public Health found opioid deaths cost the state $1.4 billion in 2014. And that doesn't include things like the cost of treatment or incarceration of people suffering from addiction. This session, lawmakers want to tackle the problem from multiple angles. Republican Senator Jim Merritt alone has authored 19 bills to tackle some aspect of the drug problem in the state. There's a range of bills, some that study the addiction crisis or limit opioid prescriptions. Others bolster treatment options, which Jim McClellan, Indiana's new drug czar, says is really important. It's still early in the session, so it's unclear which of the many bills will make it all the way to the governor's desk in a few months. For Indiana Lawmakers, I'm Jake Harper. Thanks, Jake. Back in a moment with this week's roundtable discussion. Indiana Lawmakers, from the State House to your house. Purdue researchers are finding new ways to treat cancer, provide drug-free therapies, advance wound repairs, reduce chronic illness symptoms, helping people, changing lives. Purdue Research Foundation. Contact innovation at prf.org. As I noted at the top of the show, the war on drugs is evolving. Three decades ago, for example, self-styled conservatives would do anything to avoid being seen condoning drug use or coddling drug users. In 1988, U.S. Senator Jesse Helms, a North Carolina Republican, persuaded Congress to ban the use of federal money for needle exchanges. And around the same time, Indiana and nearly two dozen other states criminalized the distribution and possession of syringes without a prescription. Now, in contrast, many Hoosier Republicans, including newly elected Governor Eric Holcomb, are pushing to allow counties and municipalities to offer such programs as they see fit. Joining me to talk about the apparent shift in approach are... Republican Senator Jim Merritt of Indianapolis, Chairman of the Senate's Majority Caucus, Republican Representative Ed Clear of New Albany, the General Assembly's earliest, or one of them anyway, and most outspoken champions of needle exchange programs, Indiana's newly elected Attorney General Curtis Hill and Elkhart Republican, and Dr. Jerome Adams, Indiana's State Health Commissioner since 2014. I thank you all for being here for what I think is a very important discussion. What is the status of the war on drugs? Uh, are we winning? Are we losing? Can we tell, Jim Merritt? Well, I think we're winning. I don't think we've won. Um, I've set the goal of five years uh, to, uh, to kill heroin, and I think we'll get the job done. But just like anything else, we're assessing what assets we have. We're uh, researching what works and what doesn't. And I'm confident that at the end of session that we'll have pilot pro programs that that uh, will be prepared to be started sometime in 2018. So we can start collecting data, we can start saving lives. We're saving lives now, but we can save more lives. And it's just very important to do the right pre uh, prep work. And, and preparation is, 
has been going on with the Governor's Drug, Drug Task Force that moved around the state of Indiana. Dr. Adams was on that. That it was about two years of work that went yes, into that. You yes, were a member and, of that. We learned a great deal. Now we have to um, we have to put it in overdrive, and we have to prepare uh, to kill. And and to do that is you have to know what assets you have to you have, and, and as well as uh, be prepared to make uh, controversial decisions that are uh, really um, positive for the state of Indiana and its Hoosiers. Ed, clear. You uh, represent an area that has been hard hit, the southern mm -hmm. part of the state. Uh, down with some of the, the areas at first mm -hmm. where the red flags were, were raised about some of these issues. Right. Do you agree with the assessment that we are winning the war on drugs? Well, I'd probably, probably be um, a little more conservative in my assessment. Uh, I support uh, what my colleague Senator Merritt is working on. We've worked together on uh, quite a bit of legislation, and um, uh, he always has good ideas. I just I, I think we're still moving too slowly, and um, uh, again, I support uh, uh, what Senator Merritt is doing, but we're still talking about uh, pilots and collecting data and doing studies, and that's not how you win a war. Uh, a war takes resources, and uh, I don't think uh, as a state we are deploying enough resources, and you let out talking about syringe exchange, uh, you know, what a difference two years makes, right? Uh, but still, um, uh, to put it in the context of winning a war, uh, we're not fully deploying one of the most effective weapons we have. But you think we have enough, the state, I should say, has enough information already in hand, whether it's about the fiscal impact, whether it's about uh, the, the sheer knowledge of how many people are dying or, mm -hmm. or uh, being made seriously ill or compromised mm -hmm. in terms of their health by overdoses. Uh, one of the pieces of legislation would mm -hmm. have coroners for the first mm -hmm. time be obliged to to track this data. Sure, and, and that's absolutely necessary. Again, I support what, uh, what Senator Merritt's doing. I, I just think uh, uh, we need to be uh, deploying all available resources while we're also catching up with some of the data collection and some of the things that we should have been doing, frankly, years ago. Uh, so good legislation, uh, lots of good initiatives, but uh, if we're going to use the terminology of war, uh, then we need to fully deploy, and again, uh, with respect to uh, syringe exchange and some of the other things that we've danced around, uh, we need to fully deploy. Um, uh, Curtis Hill, you've, of course, had now a new perch here for the past month or so uh, in your office as Attorney General. So I'm interested in your take. Do you think, I'll ask the same question, do you think that Indiana is, in fact, winning the war on drugs? Well, to use your analogy of a war, we, we really have a moving target. And it goes up, it goes down, it goes in, it goes out. And we have to look at a myriad of strategies to address it. Um, as a prosecuting attorney, I focused on enforcement. And we need to inf uh, really need to double down on enforcement with regard to the, to the dealers who bring these poisons into our community. Um, but the biggest problem that we have with the drug culture is the demand. Whether it's meth, whether it's heroin, opioids, uh, the demand is what drives this. And the biggest problem that we have in Indiana, in my view, is we don't have sufficient resources for treatment for those who need it, for those who want it. And that's, I think that's what Ed's getting at in terms of the dancing around. And, and I don't think it's intentional on anyone's part, but if you look at what's going on at the street level, um, we really need to focus on making sure that people who want treatment have that availability, that the resources are there. Uh, we need to also address a regional approach. Uh, different regions of this state have different drug problems. It all comes down to demand, but we have to focus on what those particular communities need and provide the resources that they need in order to secure the problem. Well, if you look at the data, and as I did in preparation for this show, Indiana clearly is not spending as much per capita on public health, for instance, that as many of its counterparts. I think uh, we, in fact, were maybe 49th or 50th there for a time, the and maybe five. had surged up, uh, gotten all the way maybe into the mid-30s, yeah. but then that was short-lived and we're, we're back again. So money perhaps is an issue. Doctor, let's get you in here. You're, uh, mm -hmm. you're the one with the medical degree here. So you tell, answer first the question, are we winning? And if not, would money, an infusion of money uh, such as uh, Curtis Hill has described, make a difference? Well, well um, anytime you're talking about a war, you're talking about many battles. And I'm a perennial optimist, but I would say we are winning the initial battle. Uh, we often say that the first step to recovery is admitting you have a problem. Well, that, that was a real challenge. Uh, Representative Claire pointed out two years ago, we weren't at a place where people were even willing to admit that we have a problem. Scott County Forest, Indiana, the United States and the entire world, quite frankly. I've been to Switzerland and people have asked me about Scott County. Forced, mm -hmm. forced everyone to deal with the fact that we have an opioid epidemic 
and it is very different than the way we thought of opioids and drug use in the past. So in that way, the awareness, I think we are winning the initial battle. The second battle that I'm really focusing on is education and helping folks understand the science behind what can help and what, and what has not been proven successful. And that leads into the conversation about syringe exchanges. And I will tell you, I don't envy any of these gentlemen here. Um, my job's easy. I get to present the science, and the science in many cases is very clear. They have to translate the science into policy in the community. Uh, on syringe exchanges, I will tell you, uh, they do very clearly three things based on the science. Number one, they stop transmission of disease. We went from a peak of 22 cases uh, in a week of HIV in Scott County to now only having one or two at a time. The syringe exchange program has clearly stopped transmission of disease. Number two, they connect people to care. One of Governor Holcomb's pillars is to attack the opioid epidemic by getting more people connected to care. Well, there's evidence, strong evidence that shows that people who participate in syringe exchange programs are five times as likely to enter drug treatment. So if you're a governor who's saying, I want to attack the opioid epidemic, how do you ignore something that is five times as likely to get people into treatment? Number three, and this is most important but also most controversial, syringe exchange programs help protect and build communities. Communities that have syringe exchange programs have 10% less crime. That may seem counterintuitive, but you're, con you're providing not just syringes but wraparound services. The syringes are to bring people in. We're connecting people to health insurance, to testing, to, to addiction and recovery services, and they're going to be less likely to break into homes. There's evidence to show that. And law enforcement officials, finally, are, are two-thirds less likely to be stuck by a needle in communities that have a syringe exchange program. So you're building and protecting the community. That's the science. It's up to these guys to translate it into policy. You heard a ringing endorsement, uh, <laughs> and I think... Uh, uh, well, we had very few visionaries like uh, Representative Ed Clare. And, and uh, we, we actually got f caught flat-footed with the Scott County explosion. Mm -hmm. And we're catching up. And uh, there's a reason why I have 19 bills that surround, go through the opioid situation. Also, I, we spent a lot of time, and, and I think Ed would agree with this, on Narcan, and also about stigma. This is not, uh, this attic is not under a bridge with a tattoo and long hair. This is widespread, it knows no boundaries, all Hoosiers are affected by it. When you have that, you have incremental change. And, 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 uh, and we have NES babies. We have dependent babies. We have um, uh, women who are walking in hospitals pregnant but addicted to heroin. So it, it's just it's going to have to be incremental change. <laughs> Do you think change. that explains, though, the, the, this changed approach? Again, I, I would suggest, uh, if you look at the history, back to Richard Nixon first declaring the, the mm -hmm. war on drugs mm -hmm. using that, those words. Ronald Reagan, even Nancy Reagan would just say no. They would not recognize maybe this Absolutely. war of the, the war on drugs of the 21st century. Is that because of advances just in understanding of, of addiction, or is it that something you just mentioned? It's no longer somebody else's, the, the exactly. person under the bridge. You, in fact, I think you became interested in this because somebody a couple of cul-de-sacs over. Right, mm -hmm. Justin with, Phillips lost exactly. her son. And uh, yes, and, and as well as uh, Narcan, which I didn't know existed. It's been around since 1960. The force so, reverses. Yeah, the, uh, I'm sorry. The it's of... the antidote for, a, for a, an overdose. And so we've, we've spent so much time changing the conversation, the, the, the culture, the mindset, and getting rid of the stigma so that everybody, all 6.6 .6 million of us, know that we've got, a, we've got an epidemic on our hands. And that's been, that's been very difficult. And moving the, uh, the, the cruise ship in around a creek uh, has been difficult. And uh, getting the 150 legislators uh, uh, to understand it's, a, it's an illness, and it's, it's not a character flaw. Well, we and this, this epidemic evolved very differently than the past opioid epidemics. We traditionally thought of, of opioid abuse, of drug use, as a moral failing. We now know that there's science to suggest that your brain changes and it's, it's along the lines of diabetes. We wouldn't send someone to jail for eating a french fry and then showing up with a high blood sugar or for smoking a cigarette and continuing to show up with a COPD. So that's, that's different. But what's also different is that this new opioid epidemic started with, with over-prescribing. And, and you didn't have someone who made a bad decision. You have a mother who had a C-section who was sent home with pills and then all of a sudden couldn't get off those pills and ended up dependent on opioids and then using heroin. You had a high school... Heroin is a cheaper, uh, exactly. more available substance in many yeah, cases. You had a high school football player who sprained his knee, quarterback, 
and then couldn't get off the pills, and then show, ends up on heroin several years later, who lives down the street from us. And so that, that's a very different type of, of epidemic with, that's affecting everyone across the country Chris, right now. I, I bet if we had a blood pressure cuff hooked up to you, it would show that, that you're getting agitated and want to respond to some of these things, because you have concerns about the needle exchange program. You've suggested in testimony uh, before uh, committees that, that, in fact, it's not so much an exchange as a giveaway. What's your concern? Well, sure, and, and, and my blood pressure's fine. I mean, uh, first of all... <laughs> okay, doctor, uh, you're good. I'm, I'm stand down, though. No, we're good. Down. No, these are all friends of mine, and these are, these are gentlemen here and others in the General Assembly and the Governor's Office who want to make a positive change and a positive difference. So first and foremost, we're all on the same page. We want to see more Hoosiers safe. And, uh, and when we start from that premise, uh, all things are possible. So that's first and foremost. Uh, I do have concerns from my background uh, that, that a program has to have accountability. And, and we need to make sure that this program first started, and I think correctly so, in terms of defeating the issue of infectious disease. Uh, in terms of making sure that uh, uh, we get dirty needles out, clean needles in. Um, it's, very, it's very necessary to take it beyond that and make sure that that particular aspect does not get abused in terms of more needles out than more needles in or creating a bigger problem than we have. It's clearly a public health issue, but it's also a public safety issue. And one of the concerns that I've always had, it's not as simple as an addict who has a problem. Many of these folks also cross over the, the, the line into criminal behavior and conduct. So you may have someone who has a drug problem, but they also have, uh, they break into houses or they do armed robberies, or they do other things. And so we start getting into the mix of what to do with people who have a health problem, but also who have engaged in criminal behavior and how to deal with that effectively. And you mentioned you don't want more needles uh, you know, on the streets, but effectively, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, in the Scott County example, which was our earliest example and perhaps our best, 96 mm percent, -hmm. I think, of needles have, have come back in terms of getting exchanged. And, in the, and it's going up. In the last quarter, 99 percent of the needles out came back in through the syringe exchange. And you also have to understand that not everyone brings the needles back to the syringe exchange. Mm -hmm. They can dispose of them in other safe ways. And we're educating the, uh, the, the substance use disorder folks in the community in terms of proper needle disposal. Well, clear, a, a moment ago you were described, I bet you're feeling pretty good, as a visionary. I think that's the word you used, <laughs> right? I, I have a memory, see, Alzheimer hasn't paid in yet. before the show. <laughs> you were such, the danger with being a visionary or a man ahead of your time or a woman mm -hmm. ahead of your time is you're ahead of, of maybe the consensus. So you, when you were public health chair in mm -hmm. the House and you advocated this two years ago, that was something somewhat controversial and in fact, some would say, cost you your chairmanship. Mm -hmm. uh, are you... Uh, are you, sat, is it, are you in a I told you so mode, or do you wish you had done anything differently then, or do you just feel that public opinion has caught up? Well, you always look back and, and think about how you could have done certain things differently, but uh, in terms of, uh, of advocating for syringe exchange, uh, no, I, uh, I don't regret uh, fighting for it because as Dr. Adams uh, and others uh, have said, it works. Uh, the, uh, the science, the research is undisputed. Um, and <clears throat> we need to fully support it. Uh, we need to make it more widely available. Uh, you know, the, the situation in Scott County uh, grabbed national and international headlines, uh, I think, frankly, because of the presence of HIV. Uh, we already well, had... Other cases, actually. Uh, absolutely, but, but we already had uh, a, a hepatitis C crisis, mm -hmm. right, Dr. Adams? Exactly. Uh, I mean, we were in crisis well before uh, the HIV outbreak in Scott County. And uh, that was largely the result of uh, IV drug use. So hepatitis C, 80% of hepatitis mm -hmm. C plus is transmitted by injection drug use. So if you have hepatitis C in your community, you have injection drug use. And there are many communities in Indiana, a number of communities that have higher than normal hepatitis C rates. Yeah. So, so I will, I, I mean, I will continue to advocate for best practices. I think that's what Dr. Adams was talking about. Uh, uh, syringe exchange works for communities. I'm not here to suggest that uh, syringe exchange is the entire solution. It's not. In fact, it's just one part of the solution. Uh, Jim mentioned Narcan, uh, the, the availability of naloxone, the generic name for that, which is now is critical. Uh, available, He's been, uh, I guess, without prescriptions. And, yes. and one of the ideas well, or one of the pushes here is to get it into schools. And, and largely so, because of his leadership, but we still haven't gone far enough. You know, there's no reason uh, for naloxone or Narcan uh, not to be available everywhere at all times, right? I mean, yes. it, 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 
it, it doesn't uh, hurt anyone and it can save lives. It does save lives. Uh, many lives have been lost mm -hmm. because it was not available and that's what you've been uh, yes. fighting to change. But there's education to be done there because there's stigma, just like there's stigma with syringe exchange programs, there's stigma mm -hmm. attached to Narcan. And I want to go back to something that our Attorney General said, we can't do this alone. We've got to be on the same page and we really are. Um, I, I will tell you that <clears throat> our syringe exchange programs would not be successful. We would not have saved as many lives with Narcan if it weren't for our close cooperation with the law enforcement community. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Attorney General brings up points that are concerns, quite frankly, of a lot of people throughout the state of Indiana and a lot of our law enforcement officials. So I appreciate the opportunity to come here and educate the, the, the viewers, but, but quite frankly, we need to bring more people in and have that discussion both about law enforcement and public safety concerns and about what the science says in terms of syringe exchange programs and Narcan actually connecting people to care. Well, well Curtis Hill, again, there seems to be a desire here to have a consensus and I, I'm sensing there's still not quite uh, everyone at, at the same place uh, in, in the hymn book here. Sure. But I, how willing are you to go to the mat uh, as a newly elected official? You have political capital here. Is this what you spend it on, trying to get needle exchange program dialed back in some fashion? Well, I spend my capital on protecting families, and, and we're all doing the same aspect. Let's take a look at Narcan. Narcan is a very effective mechanism for saving lives. Um, but we have to look at what's happening. There's so many people out there who we've had many experiences where we've got people who are going back four, or five, six times uh, being brought back. And, and continuing on with the behavior. Uh, so we have to match up that ability to, bring, to, to save people's lives with some effort or ability to get them into the treatment program to take the medicine to stop the cycle um, with the uh, um, needle exchange. If you ask the average person about needle exchange and, and, and the average person that says it's okay, they're thinking you're getting one dirty needle back for one clean needle in. And in some instances you're getting much more needles out versus needles in, along with the spoon to cook it in and things of that nature, which gets very uncomfortable in terms of the process. And when we get into that process, recognizing that uh, policy-wise, we still have concerns about making sure that, they, uh, uh, that we do have laws that, that prohibit certain conduct. Uh, we want to make sure that we, that we effectively put in tools uh, uh, to provide guidance on how to do this properly. Let me, and I don't want to swerve off the path, but I do want to ask, based on what we saw in Washington this week, where the Attorney General, granted, different apples to oranges scenario, you're elected official, but the notion, do you view, and I don't want to get bogged down here, but generally speaking, you disagree with the governor on this, are you the governor's attorney on this issue if it ever were litigated, or, or are you a man of conscience well, who... who well, first, not of all, first of all, I, it's, I, it's not that I disagree with the governor. I'm going to regret going down this uh, path because this will no, take no, another no. show. But it's, it's not that I disagree with the governor. I, I came to the committee and testified that I have concerns and that we should express caution or use caution in how we're going and make sure that there's accountability in this process. Um, I've offered to, and I will continue to offer to work with everyone to fashion uh, uh, programs that we can all work together and support. So this isn't a matter of being against anyone. As I said, we are all on the same page to fighting this effort, and I will use my capital to work into the program. I don't have a vote on this. this that's these gentlemen. I'm here to assist, to provide my take on things. Um, I, uh, Jim's got great ideas, and I hope to work with him and say, you know, Jim's going down a path, and I might be able to say, Jim, have you thought about this? And maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, but the idea is to provide that input so that we can <coughs> fashion together the best approach. How large but, should, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just real quickly, uh, we have to get past uh, imposing arbitrary limits, though, because and I'm going to challenge the Attorney General a little bit. When, when we talk about you should only be able to receive Narcan a certain number of times or you should only be able to participate, uh, I think you were quoted in the Star recently talking about participate in a, a syringe exchange program for a limited uh, period of time. Uh, you know, Dr. Adams mentioned diabetes. That's uh, one of our go-to examples. Uh, we don't tell people after the third or fourth or fifth time that they fail in their diabetes uh, management program that they're out. Um, and, you know, what do we tell the grieving parents of the person who couldn't receive Narcan the fifth time because we said you can only have it four times? I mean, that we have to focus on best practices. 
Well, and I'm, and I'm not suggesting... And this will have to be the last word, but uh, okay, time I'm, does fly here. And I'm not suggesting that you would stop that. What I'm suggesting is that when you bring someone back from Narcan, we need to put them in a facility and make sure that they're getting the help that they need based upon that effort to lose their life. That's Agreed. an opportunity to put them in a, in a, facil uh, a uh, medical facility at that point and begin the treatment. And that's why it's going to take treatment dollars to win the war, and we all agree on Gentlemen, that. Gentlemen, if you look in the dictionary about scratching the surface, the phrase, I think this discussion <laughs> is about it because we could talk about money and the Affordable Care Act and the impact on Medicaid funding. Absolutely. Ah, time to, does fly too fast. Important topic, and I appreciate the insights and the opinions that you all have shared you, with our uh, listeners and viewers across the state. Again, my guests have been Republican Senator Jim Merritt of Indianapolis, Republican Representative Ed Clear of New Albany, Indiana Attorney General Curtis Hill, and State Health Commissioner Jerome Adams. Indiana is one of a few states that doesn't have some form of hate crime legislation. That could change this session. The debate over bias crimes on the next Indiana Lawmakers. And time now for our weekly conversation with Ed Feigenbaum, publisher of the newsletter Indiana Legislative Insight. Ed, is, is this whole issue a medical issue or a criminal justice issue? It's, it's one of those combination issues, John. Just like everything at the State House, you can't really separate the two. But well, what you're seeing is that the, the medical professionals tend to view things in, in one light, as you saw from Dr. Adams, and the legal professionals, the criminal justice system, views it and from another perspective, like Attorney General Hill did. And the, the local prosecutors are, are really on the, the Hill side of, of this issue, if, if you're really choosing sides here. And they're also concerned that some of these syringe exchange programs go beyond just the simple act of exchanging needles and that some of the kits that are being provided in, in their local communities, unbeknownst to them originally, go a lot further than just the needles and include things that would, would be components in helping to you know, cook the, uh, the drugs and things like that. And they're, they're concerned about that because they think that it's enabling the individuals. But at the same time, the, the public health professionals there say, well, it's not just a problem with respect to the, the kinds of, of opiates that we're looking at, but we're, we're also concerned about people who aren't injecting drugs but are using these kits, the, the, uh, the cooking uh, spoons and, and uh, little vials and things like that, and the, the cotton, and they're contracting things like hep C and spreading that. Which of these two stances, the, the prosecutorial stance or the medical stance, is a better reflection of the Hoosier voting public and Hoosiers as a whole? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, th I think that's a, a difficult question to answer, and, and I'm not sure that the, the people are educated enough to make that kind of an answer, because I don't know that, that even legislators have, have come to any conclusions about that, and, and that's part of this process. You've got what the, the, the 19 bills that, that Senator Merritt was, was talking about there, and there are a number of different things that are going on to educate legislators and right how now. important that the governors weighed in on this on the side of treatment? I think that it's very important that the governor weighed in early on the, the side of, of not slow walking some of the preventive programs, and that's driving a lot of this debate. Quite a departure from his predecessor, I suppose. Absolutely. Very good, Ed. Thank you, as always, for your insight. We'll see you next week. For more information, episode streams, and extra content, visit us on the web at wfyi.org lawmakers. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can access live streaming coverage of the General Assembly on the Internet as well. And remember, you can get our show on demand from Xfinity. Well, that concludes another edition of Indiana Lawmakers. I'm John Chuanis, and on behalf of WFYI Public Media, Indiana's other public broadcasting stations, and my colleagues Ed Feigenbaum and Jake Harper, I thank you for joining us, and I invite you to visit WFYI.org for more State House coverage. Until next week, take care. What if a robotic arm could help disabled students reach for their dreams? It does. Introducing RoboDesk. To learn more about this and more than 400 other world-changing Purdue technologies, visit otc-prf.org.